Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hi, I'm Jason, with Jason Pollock. I am not Jason. Join Jason and Justin back in the green room as they talk with some of their favorite folks from the entertainment industry. And now, the man you haven't been waiting for, Jason Pollock! Hey, Richie. Hey, Jason. Justin cannot be here tonight. Thank you for filling in. Um, My pleasure. We got a bit of a late start. I was contemplating because we have a tornado warning going on as we speak. So I'm thinking, do I care that much about the show? Where I am, yeah. So if I get blown away, um, as Bobby, the producer, was saying earlier, we might get actually the the podcast might actually get picked up today by a tornado. (laughs) I wanted it to get picked up, but that wasn't the direction I wanted to take it. You're, Richie, you're like Dorothy. Thank you so much. My wife loves Judy Garland. That must be what she sees in me. <laughs> All right, Richie. Listen, I appreciate you being here. You are a um, you're one of my favorite comedians. You're a, for those of you who don't know Richie, you, you're missing out on a great comic. You are. You are. You absolutely are. He's a great warm up. He's a warm up act for Doctor Oz. But we're not about Richie today. Richie's just here to help me talk to. <laughs> move on, Jason. Move, move on. We're good. And Richie, you've got a musical background as well. So yeah, you get along with our, I'm our guest. I'm so excited about our guest. I really am. Yeah, I was looking at his videos. He's amazing. Let's bring him out now. He's he's a he's a musician. He's an actor. He's a filmmaker. He's a novelist. He does it all. I'll let him tell you what else he's done if he doesn't want if I don't know it. Please bring him out. Darren Dalton of Fuck, Darren Dowler. Dal- 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 I like that Dalton. little yeah, name you Dar- gave me. That was good. Darren Dalton. Wow. Oh. Wrong, wrong. Dar- I'm so sorry. Darren F. Dowler. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good hey, middle Darren. name. <laughs> Darren, thank you for being here, man. My pleasure. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy getting together with a couple of bros and laughing out and, talk- and talking crap. And, you know, it's good. Yeah, I mean, uh, you may be the first guest who literally watches me get blown away by something. Hey, if tornado you know warning how joke. Famous you'll be next week. <laughs> oh my God, that would be sure to go viral. <laughs> and you're going on tour next week, aren't you? I am. Yeah. So you, I'm, uh, think of I'm how many more people you would draw. Where are you going? I am going. Uh, well, I'm starting the tour, uh, flying to Fort Lauderdale, and you know, uh, Celebrity Cruises is relaunching their ship. Fleet now, so I'm going to be helping them uh, bring the Equinox back out. So oh, I'll cool. be the featured entertainer on, uh, on the Equinox next week, and then we're going down to the Bahamas, and we've got some stuff going on down there. And then uh, that's this week, and then a couple of weeks from there, I fly out to Los Angeles and I go down and do some South American stuff. Wow, very cool! That's amazing. I'm just well, glad to get back to work. <laughs> your music is so universal. I was watching. I got obsessed. I was looking at your website, DarrenDowler.com, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at your your website and just blown away by your videos. Oh, and your man. music alone is just it's so universal. It's so much fun. It's a very bluesy country sound. We've got um, some really cool stuff. I'm in the studio right now finishing up my latest album, which is called Back to the Garage. And it's stuff I've wanted to cut for a long time. And yeah, these originals out really good. As a matter of fact, I'm in this contest right now, and it's a contest with a bunch of other recording artists to see who's going to open at the Hollywood Bowl and then do a pay-per-view special with their new album and new material. So I'm actually it's a it's kind of a vote. It's not really a it's one of those contests. Unfortunately, it's all about the votes you get on social media. Everything's about social oh. media these days. Yeah. Nothing to do with the music really. But but anyway, so I'm in this contest, and I'm I'm in the running. I, I'm in like third place right now. So I'm hoping that a whole bunch of people will vote by the end of the day because uh, I think tomorrow's the next cuts. We already made it through round one. I made it to round two, but I'm up against these really young bands that have these like huge social media followings and stuff like that because they've been yeah. on computers every day for you know 15 years. And I've been out playing music, and um, so we'll see what happens. I don't know, but uh, but yeah, the new album is rock and it's kind of a it's kind of pop rock blues, you know, it's got, it's got, it's got lyrics that could be pop, but it's got guitar that's rock. And then it's got that bluesy Southern edge to it. So it, it's going to be good stuff. Yeah. A little bit of a Stevie Ray Vaughan thing going on, which is, which is really nice. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was this new song called The Way You Love Me, which I just finished in the studio. There's a sample of it on my website for this contest. It's called The Way You Love Me, and it's a dirty, down Memphis blues tune. It's really cool. Love that feel. That's nice. fantastic. I imagine okay. it. Oh. Um, I, I have a question for yeah. that. It, as comics, we're dealing with that all the time, that like people on Facebook or uh, YouTube or whatever, TikTok, oh, that guy's a really funny comic. And you're like, that guy's not a comic at all. <laughs> you know, are, are, are you dealing with that a lot in the uh, music business? Because I, I got to believe you are. Well, I think we can all agree the internet has given a stage to everybody who yeah. wants to do mm-hmm. something. So where you used to have, say, 100 bands, now you've got a 1,000 bands because every amateur band in the world is on there claiming to be a pro band. And, and right. Not that I knock that. I mean, I, anybody's got, you know, motivation and drive and you want to do something, I'm all for it. But it does cloud the waters a little bit, I won't lie. And right. It's, it's so easy to get away with it. I, I started playing piano during the pandemic, and I learned four songs that I memorized. So I, I'll record myself playing it almost as a joke, and I'll get comments, you're so good, you're so good, and I'm really not. <laughs> but it's so... If it's the right person sees it, you got to watch this guy. And I'm playing the right song. It, more people will share it. And it's so easy to become a viral sensation. Oh, uh, it hasn't crazy. happened to me, but. I mean, look at Justin Bieber. He guys made $100 million. You know, he was just a kid that put out some videos on the internet and they caught, you know, something happened where he caught on and went viral. Now he's this big music star made by the internet. He was literally produced by the internet. It's amazing to watch. I mean, yeah, I'm I, all for it. If that can happen for you, hey, I don't knock it at all. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I get it, but it's a weird, and I, I like that it does. I like that in some ways, because there's no suit going. Hey, you're not the right thing. You're not, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, but we also have to work that hard to get that to happen. You know what I mean. True. But I think the beauty of the internet, though, is this. I was just talking to a guy the other day because I'm I'm going to seriously grow my you know my online presence this upcoming year because I've been out performing, you know, literally nonstop for the last 25 years. So you, I'm uh, I'm going to kick butt on getting the internet built up. But the guy, I, I, it was a guy I was talking to. He represents this model, and she's got like millions of followers, millions, like six or eight million followers on her Instagram page. And I asked him, I said, what is that like? He goes, well, for you, I'll put it to you this way. He goes, if you had a million followers, he goes, one half of 1% of all those people would buy everything you put on your website for sale. He goes, and sometimes up to 4.5% would buy it. So if 1%, what is 1% of a million? Was it 10,000 or something? So I'm Jewish, but I'm not good at math. I'm sorry. You know, I think it's like 10,000, but you know, imagine in one push of a button, because you've got this huge following, you could sell $50,000 worth of merchandise just from going click and 50,000 yeah. bucks is going to come in the, in the door. Yeah. But for you guys, like for comedians, if you had a million people, uh, the, the lowest amount of people that would buy your new DVD release or, or CD release would be one half of 1%. That's the lowest. And it can be four and a half percent. A really great viral product can go as high as 10%. But if you've got a million people, let's say you're selling a twenty dollars CD, let's say it is ten thousand, you know, ten thousand people at twenty dollars. Do the math on that. You just made two hundred grand. Yeah, Richie, we got to get a million followers. I'm ready. I'm and, and and we're gonna follow Darren's lead. And I'm gonna be. I'm gonna make you, Richie, the next Justin Bieber. Look at you. You're ready. You're almost there. Look at me. I I can. Richie Burner. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> um. Darren, I got to ask you. I saw the people you were playing with before. Um, you know, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Chuck Negron from Three Dog Night. Were you on the Happy Together tour? No, oh, we, we didn't do the Happy Together tour. Uh, I was with Paul Revere and the Raiders, which was the whole band minus Mark Lindsay. Mark Lindsay oh, went okay. out solo as of 70, 1974. And Mark was doing the Happy Together tour uh, with the Happy Together yes. band. And uh, he was doing that for like the last eight or nine, ten years. He just retired from that. He's not touring anymore. I think he's got some health issues or something. I, I can't swear to that, but I think I heard that. And um, 
and uh yes but the happy together tour is still going strong i've got friends on that tour right now. oh it's so much fun yeah yeah but you sure. do you work with chuck negron though right oh yeah i sing with chuck many times yeah what, what happened was back when they were doing the happy together tour paul revere started the his own tour and um it was a uh, where the action is tour we called it that was his show way back when oh baby come on won't you tell me where the action is that was one of the songs in the show so he said, you know what, we're not going to do Happy Together because Mark's doing that. We're going to do the Where the Action Is Tour. So we started we started our own version of the Happy Together Tour, and it was gangbusters, man. We had we had the Guess Who. We had Chuck Negro on a Three Dog Night. We had uh, one of the Supremes. We had uh, – it was a killer show. What a plethora that, of music. Know, My God. Peter Rivera from Rare Earth. I mean, it was a – and, and uh, uh, Mitch Ryder was on that show with us. You know, I mean, it kicked. It really kicked. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Chuck Negron is an enigma, man. He's I, I noticed when I was watching him live a couple years ago, he had some wires going up through his nose, through his from his nose to his ear. Yeah. I looked that up, but it's like a COPD machine, but it's yeah. He looked amazing though. He sat for having COPD on him all that time, he's still belting out like he did in his twenties. The guy was unbelievable. Chuck, Chuck's a great guy, and uh, the cool thing was, I, of course, got to sing with him because you had to have those three vocal parts going on, but our band, the Raiders, were actually the band for the whole tour, so whether it was Mary Wilson of the Supremes or Chuck Negron, we not only got out there and sang with him, but we had to learn the music very intricately as well, so we learned every note of every song, you know, because the Raiders are a perfectionist band. They're one of the best bands I've ever worked with. The musicians were great. Really? Oh, they're great, man. You know, I mean, we had Doug Heath on guitar, Ron Foose on bass guitar. We had Dan Krause on keyboards, a guy named Tom Sheckle, who was with the Buckinghams for 30 years on oh, the drums. Wow. And, wow. That's kind I mean, of it was, just a, it was an A cast band. It really was. And, and every night we played, it was just a blast. You've of course, Paul was there until he passed away. You know, he was playing keyboards, and his son, Jamie wow. Revere, was playing guitar. Wow. Yeah, good times, man. Really good times. Chuck's a great guy too. He's a lot of fun to perform with. Uh, well, he's—I mean, the guy's a legend. There's yeah, a, he, good. No, I—I I heard of. I was watching. What was it? The Moth. He did a story on one of those. Not. I don't think it was a TED Talk or a. Or is the story? No, I'm sorry. Somebody told a story about him on the Moth. <laughs> oh. Is um. His his he broke his penis. So to speak. Oh wow! I didn't know about that. Yeah, it's just, it's, wow. I, I was reading wow. about all the issues this guy's had. I mean, um, that's the one that really stuck out. Penis? Can we break it? it is breakable? Mm -hmm. Apparently, oh. it is. Don't try this at home or anywhere. Actually, <laughs> I mean, I know it can take a bend. It can get bruised, but man, you can actually break it. Wow. You can break it. You can break the shit. Yeah. You can wow. Break it. Ow. Richie, I know, Richie. You're speaking from experience. <laughs> like bam, bam, bam. Ow. <laughs> yeah uh, i mean you know, you know what's cool about guys like chuck though when you get up there and do that music the reverence from the audience is just you know that's been the blessing of my career you know 30 years ago when i was performing in a casino show in reno i met all these headliners because i was in the same showroom you know i met bill medley of the righteous brothers i met uh, tony butello the letterman i met uh Guys like Chuck and Gary Puckett and all these guys and Paul Revere. I met them all in these showrooms. And, you know, and then uh, it, it, it started this, like, kind of thing where they knew that my vocal range was very broad. And, and I also have a, a unique ability to sound like just about anybody if I want to. And so you I do. I was watching your videos. You, you, you did. You became like Neil Diamond. Uh, uh, you became everybody you were in. With, I can't remember all the songs you were doing. But you just went from one after another, and you just, you're like uh, the ultimate tribute act. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing impressions since I was a little kid. My mom. Uh, really? Yeah, I did uh, impressions when I was really little. I, I learned all the cartoon characters. I started learning the TV characters, and it made my mom laugh. And that's why I started doing it, because I wanted my mom to laugh. You know, she really worked hard, <laughs> single mom and stuff. So when I made her laugh, I was like, oh, I'm going to keep doing this. And then before you know it, you know, moved 30 years down the road, I, was, I had a studio, a voiceover studio in uh, Orlando, Florida, back in the early 90s, and I was doing radio, I produced radio commercials, and back when we could do celebrity voices, which we're not really supposed to do that anymore without releases, 
but I used to do all kinds of celebrity voices. I did Elvis Press. Every commercial you ever heard that had Elvis's voice with me. I was Bill Clinton. I was I was all these different, you know, be like, well, the only thing that sucks here is my wife. Anyway, so we got to, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was doing all these voices. And I remember, you know, it was back in the band days, you know, when I was trying to, you know, make a living playing music locally, which I finally found out was very difficult. So I was doing, you know, radio commercials on the side. And I remember a guy called me one day and, and, he, and it was my first really well-paying radio commercial. He says, hey, man, I, I heard you do voices. I'm doing this commercial. I need a Michael Bolton. Can you sing like Michael Bolton? And I've never done a Michael Bolton impression ever. But I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, sure. He's one of my guys. Yeah. Never turn anything down. Get it. And, and I did it. And, and lucky for me, because impressions are weird. Like I've got impressions that took me a year to learn. And then I've got impressions that I learned right on the spot. And Michael Bolton was one of those right on the spot impressions. It just came natural to me where, you know, like, uh, for instance, I'll give you one like Sean Connery and Christopher Walken. Both took me a really long time to learn their voices and their mannerisms for some reason. But guys like Elvis and Michael Bolton and Satchmo and Donald Duck, you know, I could do those like almost instantly. So it was crazy. <laughs> Donald Duck? Oh, yeah, man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, and and all these legends you worked with, and and I I gotta ask you, how did you end up working for the Backstreet Boys? That's actually a cool story. I was in Orlando at the time, and I had a band uh, that was called uh, uh, The Change, and the band folded. I started a new band called The Fly Boys, which became really quickly a, a rock and roll, southern kind of rock and roll band that was playing all over Orlando, and we were doing really well. And this manager walks in one day, and I was always into rock and roll and blues and stuff like that. And this guy walks in and he goes, hey, man, I'm a manager for this new band. Uh, how would you like to play guitar for a boy band? And I was like, get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell my fans that I'm going to be playing guitar for a boy band. They'll laugh me off stage. And then he, he said a sentence that I've never forgotten. And he says, well, we pay $100 a rehearsal. I went, I guess I just became the lead guitar player for a boy band. <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoyed it. And then I met the kids, you know, the Backstreet Boys. And, uh, you know, it's funny. We, I was just talking to my wife about this today. It was a funny how it all happened because the kids, they were all really nice guys. And they're very talented. They really are. Unfortunately, they had that guy, Lou Pearlman, who was in charge of the group. And he was not fun to be around. Really? Yeah, you know, he was awful. He, was, he stole like hundreds of millions of dollars. He, he yeah. With the prison for a Ponzi scam, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. he, oh, he wow. made millions with Backstreet, and that wasn't enough for him. He still had to run a Ponzi scam, and uh, and, he, and he had all kinds of other crap going on too. And he, and he didn't pay us. That's why I, I quit the band because I did five or ten rehearsals, whatever it was. And he I see, he walks in one day. Hey, when are we getting paid, man? It's supposed to be a hundred bucks a night cash. He goes, Oh, I'm not paying you guys. That's that's how he did it. He was like, I'm not paying you guys. Wow. I said, Wait a minute, you you send a guy to come hire us we get a 100 bucks a night if you don't pay us we're going to court and he was just like yeah i'm just not gonna put any more money because what happened was backstreet wasn't getting picked up uh the record companies weren't interested in the very beginning they had to go to europe for a couple of years and get a couple of hits over there then come back to the u.s and then the record companies all wanted them that's how it went down. right and uh, i was almost one of them believe it or not i was if i'd have been three years younger i would have been one of them what happened was one of the boys got fired. The original group, the mother was causing issues at the rehearsals. So they just said, fire him. We'll just bring in another kid. Well, Kevin, the older one, came to me and he said, man, I heard you you sang and danced at Broadway and all that stuff. I said, yeah, I did. He goes, dude, why don't you work with us? I'd love to have another older guy in the band so I'm not the only one over 12. You know? <laughs> and I was like, I said, well, I'd love the gig, man, because I, I could tell it was going to be mine. You, you just knew it. As soon as they started singing and the songs were good, I'm like, oh. And they had money behind them. I said, this is going to be so it, I was just, I was 30 at the time. And it was like, it's hard to be a Backstreet Boy when you're 30. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kevin was like 24 working as I got, I got to tell you, I mean, you're a good looking dude. You could have pulled it off. Man, I sure would like to. I, I love their songs. I'm actually a big Backstreet Boys fan. I, I probably, another friend of mine played guitar with them later after they hit. But I was off doing other stuff at the time. So I was out. At that point, I was in L.A. trying to get into movie business and stuff like that. So. Yeah, you did something with Billy Bob Thornton, didn't you? Yeah, I did. One of the greatest gigs I ever had. Uh, There's a movie he was in a few years ago. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was called Eagle Eye. Do you remember that movie? Yes. It sounds Good real, movie. I didn't see it. It sounds really familiar, though. 
Real good movie. Well, I had a great gig, man, on that particular show. That's a Steven Spielberg movie, by the way. Uh, really? On that particular show, yeah, Spielberg was there every day. He's a great guy, too. And I didn't know it. What's funny is I took the job. I got on set, and I knew Damien Caruso was directing it. And it was in the Spruce Goose hangar. They rebuilt the Hall of Congress for this movie. That's how big it was. And um, it was in the Spruce Goose, the Howard Hughes hangar, where he built the Spruce Goose. That's how big this movie was because they they legitimately recreated the entire Hall of Congress, 360 degrees. It was amazing when you walked in. I was that's like, impressive. That's, wow. that's going to be millions of dollars for a set, you know. But I, I get a tap on my shoulder one day, and I had a great job. My job was I was actually a stunt actor. On that uh, movie, I was supposed to be a stunt guy with lines. I ended up not having lines at the end of it, though. But but my job was uh, I would keep Michelle Monaghan safe because we had to run up these stairs when Shia LaBeouf fired this gun in the air. And my job was to turn around, fall back on the stairs and catch Michelle for three days. That's what I did. And she you had to catch Michelle on it. That's Mahoney. awesome. Oh, it was awesome, dude. And, and she was so sweet, too. So. <laughs> Getting personal, I guess. So the way I, the way you do a fall like that is she has to come down on a resting spot. So as I would turn, fall on the stairs, and put my hands here, and then literally her breasts would fall into my hands. And, and you got paid for this. And I got paid well for that, just for catching Michelle Monaghan's breasts every day. And she was so sweet because when we did the first take, I said, I said, do you understand how this works? And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I have to kind of catch you on your chest to keep you from hitting the floor. She goes, no, it's totally good. So we did the, we did the first take and fell, and I caught her. And she, she's right above me. And she goes, hi, I'm Michelle. Those are my breasts. <laughs> <laughs> great gig. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. That's funny. A lot of fun, man. No, well, wait, I got to go back to the Backstreet Boys because now I'm thinking about it. I'm getting them confused with NSYNC. I know the song. Same Back guy. Streets we'll back, all right. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> not in sync. That's obvious. Bless you. That's obviously the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. I can't think of one song they sing apart from I or remember. That that's right. That's the Backstreet Boys. I know the Weird Al version. I bought it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I choked when you said that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> That's great. That is funny. What, what notables came out of the Backstreet Boys? I know. I, I'm wait. Justin Timberlake in sync, right? That was in sync. Yeah. I'm getting. I, Boys, I didn't none know. Of, none of the guys. None of the Backstreet Boys actually. Brian Latrell did some stuff on his own, but they they've always been a group. I wouldn't say one of them really shot out as a solo artist at all. I mean, right. Howie had a couple solo songs. Uh, I think AJ had one solo song that kind of did something. <laughs> But, you know, it's amazing that those guys, um, they can still get together and fill a 25,000-seater like that. It's amazing. Oh, their fans were loyal. They had oh, some nerd. really crazy yeah. loyal fans. I, I was just more impressed. <laughs> I mean, it, it's impressive to hear you play with the Backstreet Boys, but then like you, we have a mutual friend who said, you got to get Darren Dowler on. He played with the Backstreet Boys. And I said, that's awesome. But then I looked you up and heard your other stuff and saw the other people you played with. And I was like, oh, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah, I've, ha I've been very blessed. I've had a uh, really good, like, um, it, what's strange is I feel like my career's just now ramping up. Though I've got uh, this new album coming out, which is maybe the best album I've ever done. And, I, and I'm on, oh, man, I'm on a lot of albums. And uh, Were you a studio musician as well? Yeah, I mean, I used to do a lot of studio vocals, some studio guitar in the old days and early. But I, I mean, I was just I performed with so many groups. Like I, when I came out of the uh, casino circuit, the first group to hire me was an old harmony group called the Letterman, and you know, which I was Letterman. amazed they wanted yeah. me to sing with them because I'm a rock and roll singer. You know, I'm a blues rock and roll singer with a country sound. And but but the guys liked my show and they liked my voice, so they gave me. And it was one of the best jobs I've ever had. For ten years, I was with those guys. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm on 15 albums with those guys. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. And um, one of them is That's called The Greatest Movie Hits, and it's one of the best albums you've ever heard, man. It's got great stuff on it. And then, you know, then of course, you know, I, I worked with Bill Medley, The Righteous Brothers, for a couple of years. And then I worked with Paul Revere and The Raiders, and I actually produced the records that I'm on with them. I produced The, the Greatest Hits and Live. And um, as a matter of fact, I have, I, I have the last two 
Paul Revere and the Raiders songs, which I have not released yet. It's a long story, but Paul came to me right before he died, actually, six months before he died, possibly, and said, hey, Dara, I, uh, you know what, because I, as soon as I joined the group, I was like, Paul, you've got these great hits, and you've got this huge following. Let's, let's write some new stuff. But, you know, a lot of those older artists, they really are comfortable just doing the old hits, you know. But Paul and the guys, we were capable of getting another hit record because when you get 10 million followers, you can do that. You can have another gold platinum record. I said, why don't we do it? And long story short was he was resistant to it for the first couple of years I was in the group. Then he started thinking about it. And the last year when he got sick, he came to me. We were on this ship called the American, was something bad, American something steamboat. It was a steamship, a river cruise boat that we did a tour on, which was really cool, man. We got to see the river uh, canals of all of America. And um, and uh, he said, write me some songs. I want to cut some new songs. So I wrote the first two songs. We cut them, and then Paul died. Oh, and unfortunately, it's so great that he trusted you with that, though. That's an honor. It, it was amazing. And, and honestly, it caused, I think it caused some hard feelings, too, because there were other guys in the band that wanted to write you know, songs for him, and he was kind of resistant to it. And uh, But he knew I was a songwriter, and, and so I wrote these two songs. So I'm, I'm actually going to release them in the next few months. We're going to package them real nicely, and they're gonna, it's going to say my last two songs with Paul Revere. And it'll be the last two wow. songs produced by Paul Revere. Wow. And uh, we were supposed to release those with a, play, uh, a company called Voodoo Donuts, uh, like – five or six years ago, but we had, there was some kind of weird turmoil going on in the management between the band and management and all this stuff. And there was a guy in the organization who kind of killed the deal. So it never got done, but in a way it's kind of cool because then I took the songs back. I remastered them. And uh, so now I get to release them the way I want to. And I just, I just want them to be a tribute to Paul and his longevity in the business. Cause he really was a great guy. Wow. Good to hear. Richie, was it you? I don't. I know we were talking about a musician, Richie, where you said, I want to ask him if this guy was an asshole. I don't remember if it was you talking about somebody Darren worked with or somebody else, but I figured... Um, no, I, I don't... <laughs> I've worked with some assholes. <laughs> Let me tell you. Some divas, would... too. <laughs> you, but you work with Three Dog Night, which is one of my favorite bands of all time and as a singer the three of them and chuck negron and everything and the songs uh and harry nielsen wrote for them and just the whole thing when, when did you work with them tell me about i just want to hear about three dog night well it was it was like about let's see what year was that i can't remember exactly what years i'm guessing it was about eight years ago when we started the uh where the action tour is seven or eight years ago maybe seven years ago um, so we had other guys on the show and all of a sudden, um, I heard that Chuck was going to be on the show. Uh, and Who's I was like, Oh my amazing. God, are you kidding me? Amazing. Three dog night. We're going to get to sing three dog night songs. Mama told me not to come. I mean, there was so, Love so many other songs. Is the loneliest number. Harry and, Nielsen um, wrote, wrote that song. Who did? Harry Nielsen. Oh, he wrote that song. He wrote. Yeah. One? Uh, that's right. He wrote most of their songs, didn't he? Yeah. Great song, man. And it, it was so good. The, our version of that song was so good and so driving because imagine you got Three Dog Night, which we played it true to form, but then we put the Raider Rock Edge behind it. So when the song really kicks in at the end, you got the big boom, guitar. Boom, 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 boom. Powerful. And then just to be out there and actually hear Chuck's voice, you know, that that was awesome. And I, I would always sing the high harmonies because I've got the high voice in the group. And it was so cool to be singing above Chuck Negron in these little layer uh, harmony parts. That would be ridiculously cool. And then we get to play those great guitar parts and stuff like that. I mean, it was it was really killer. I mean, every single one of the songs was a top ten song. Every, every, every one. I'm wrong. Mama Told Me Not to Come was, was uh, Randy Newman. Oh, it was. Harry Nielsen wrote one. Oh. Yeah, but Randy Newman, who was amazing. Interesting. Oh, all right, yeah. one of those guys, somebody notable wrote, um, uh, yeah, what's, uh, I love the song too, because it reminds me of a Sid and Marty Croft theme. Um, <laughs> I can't, th it's Three Dog Night. Um, Joy to the World. No, not Joy to the World. I, though I did do karaoke Joy to the World once on a <laughs> dare and pulled it off. I had people dancing. My throat was killing me, but I pulled it off. 
I was no Chuck Negron, but for an amateur, I was proud of myself. I'm going to punch it up here. Um, you know what I'm yeah, Eli's Shambhala. coming. Shambhala. Joy yeah. to the world. Shambhala. One. Shambhala is a great song, but it's great song. Song. Oh, just an old-fashioned love song. That's right. Oh, that's a great, great song. song. Just an old song. Uh oh, did I just demonetize this? Just an old-fashioned <laughs> love song. How long did you work with them? Uh, Chuck did the show. Ooh, my memory is not the best. I think we did two seasons of the show with him. So we probably did like, it wasn't a long season like Happy Together. I think we had 10 shows, maybe eight or 10. And I think okay. I think we did it two years in a row with Chuck. And then I think Chuck jumped ship and he went over to Happy Together because they actually had more uh, concerts lined up. And we had more of our Raider concerts. And right, he didn't right, have right. three dog concerts. So he went to Happy Together so he could get more shows. Oh, <clears throat> right. Who'd so, you like working with the most? Probably, mm -hmm. I would say Paul Revere. Who, who'd you like working with the most? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. You know, Paul Revere was really, really great to work with. So was Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers. I'd have to put Oh, Bill really? Up. I'd have to put Bill and Paul kind of kind of even seem. Bill, Bill has always, Bill has been a, a friend and a fan of mine for, you know, since 1993 when I met him. He used to get me up on stage at the casino to sing with him. And uh, he's he's a great guy. He's always been a big supporter of, of me. And uh, and like I said, Bill's one, Bill is actually the one who got me the job with Paul Revere and the Raiders because I was working on a television show called Criminal Minds. You guys remember that show? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I played a cop on that show a couple times. And um, uh, I was actually on set, and they had just called action. And I was waiting on a movie audition at the time, so I had my cell phone mistakenly in my holster i pulled my plastic gun out <laughs> and put my cell phone in there and uh and you're not supposed to do that uh, but I, this movie was something i've been waiting on and i couldn't miss the call well right after the director called action i had putting the cell phone in my holster i'd hit the little volume switch and so it started ringing after they called action oh my god and i was like oh my god this is going to be bad because cut cut who's got a cell phone on set because it's a no-no and I said, look, I'm really, really sorry. And as I picked up the phone, I see it's Bill Medley, who I hadn't talked to in years. And I was like, Bill's calling. Wow. And just to get myself out of trouble, because I could have been in some you know, financial trouble over there. Blowing a take of a, of a big show like that, it could be a thousand. Right. Believe me, I know. So, yeah, <laughs> so I went to I went to the director and I said, look, I'm really, I'm really sorry. I was waiting on this phone call from, you know, who Bill Medley, the Righteous Brothers is? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, uh, I was... I showed him the thing. I said, I've been waiting on this guy. He goes, oh, well, go take that. We'll, we'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> he was a big Bill Medley fan, so it got me out of That's trouble. Amazing. But but I heard that phone call. Bill that was one of the greatest great phone guy. calls in the world. I got two jobs in one phone call. Bill goes, Darren, I want you to come sing with me. He goes, I need a high voice in the band. I'm not Righteous Brothers anymore. I'm Bill Medley, but I still need that high vocal in the band. He goes, I want you to come do it. Maybe you can play some guitar or whatever. And I said, I'd love to, man. He goes, but here's the catch. You also got to sing with Paul Revere and the Raiders because you're going to come out and do their half of the show. Then you're going to change. We get 10 minutes, and then you're going to come out and do my half of the show. So I got two national gigs in one phone call. And, I, and the way he said it was like, yeah, cool. this is going to be a lot of work for you. But I was like, are you kidding me? Really? Oh, it was great. It was wow. Great. We cool. went down to Branson and took over Andy Williams Theater for a couple of years. And Branson? Mm-hmm. That's great, man. Wow. Where's home for you now? Hmm? Where's home for you now? I moved to uh, from Los Angeles to Kansas City about two years ago. Oh, you're in Kansas City. I sure am. I love it here, man. We, Missouri? Kansas City is one of those towns that until you spend time here, people don't realize how great it is. Yeah, I have a friend who lives there now. He, he loves it. Loves it's a great town, man, especially coming from L.A. I got out of L.A. at the right time. People were starting to go crazy there. And I was like, let me get, I, I looked at my wife one day. I said, we're getting out of here. Because, you know, the whole Trump thing was happening and and that dark wave was coming over and people were falling in, you know, in, it, it got really dark there for a while, man. And then, oh, and yeah. then, of course, you know, with COVID and all that stuff, I'm glad I was out of there for that. How did you find Kansas City? Like, what made you go there? 
You know, when I was in Branson, well, my wife is from here and her family's here and I love her family. I mean, we have a really tight knit family, big family, and they're all here. And so it was a it was a choice of going back to Florida where my family is or some of my family or coming to Kansas City. And, you know, at the time, you know, I was going to be touring a lot because I went solo and my bookings just as soon as I announced I was you know, going to do my own thing. My agent was like, yes, because it was getting to the point where the older bands were getting hard to book, but I was still young. So when they when the when the circuit found out that I was doing it, my own show, man, the, the bookings came in and and I was going to be gone half the time. And I, I just thought, you know, if I'm going to be gone half the time, my wife should be home with her family. You know, oh, my family, I'm, I'm going to be gone. So I, my family won't be a, a you know, Florida won't be a thing. So. But then, I'm glad we came here. I mean, we're living, I mean, compared to California, the lifestyle here is so good. And we have this, I mean, we have a home here. That it's a lot more laid back. Way over $2 million in California. Easily. Oh, oh no doubt. And and uh, and the people are so nice. You know, I met two neighbors in 30 years in California. Two, two weeks into living here, I knew my whole neighborhood. You know, <laughs> it's great. Good for you, man. That's great, Darren. Yeah, my I have a new baby. I have a I have a one year old now, and I have a sixteen year old. Congratulations! So it's, thank you. It's much better for them. Much better. Oh yeah, much nicer. Except you live in Tornado Alley. Don't That's you? what they say. Tornadoes have never bothered me. I've lived in Tornado Alley my whole life. I, I'm Incidentally, from Indiana. Oh, that's right. You're in Indiana. Yeah. Then I grew up in Florida. There's a tornado every week in Florida. <laughs> You make it sound like it's it's nothing. Everybody I know who's from either Oklahoma or somewhere in Tornado Alley, oh yeah, we sit on my porch and watch them fly, fly by. It was like They're it's nothing. Awesome to watch, man. They really are. It's something. I, to I, I believe it. I believe it's a spectacle. As a neurotic dude from Jersey, uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, oh, I wouldn't like earthquakes. I hate earthquakes. Those you, things. You can't really sit you on your porch and watch earthquakes. What? I said tornado. You can see it, and in and in and in when I was in Florida, we had hurricanes too, and you get three days notice. So if somebody calls you and gives you three days notice as a hurricane coming, and you don't get in your car and go inland hundred miles, I mean that's your fault. <laughs> it's on you. It's <laughs> natural selection, man. You, you get <laughs> you get all the warning in the world, and they the things are built a little more structurally sound there, I guess, than they would be in a non-hurricane area. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I may, um, I have a I have a movie that's called Rock and Roll the Movie. It was my first movie that I produced. I've been in a lot of movies up to that point, but but it was my first movie that I wrote and produced, and scored and starred in. But it just got picked up by Fox. It was on right uh, on. Amazon Prime for the last two years, doing very well. It had a four and a half star rating up till its demise there, and um, then Fox Tubi Tubi is their streaming engine. They just put it on Tubi, so. Now my film is on Tubi TV, which is amazing. It's called Rock and Roll the Movie. Rock and Roll the Movie, yeah. I made it. Congratulations, I made it man! Right, really, great. congratulations! Wow. Thank you. It's doing great. That's my that's my one, two, three, or four. That's my third movie that I directed, and then um, and I've got a, the newest project I'm working on now. When I get back from the second tour, not this tour, in two months when I get back from all this music work. I'm producing a pilot that we're presenting to Netflix called John Christian, and it's it's cool. You guys are gonna like that. Cool, man. Cool. Congratulations show. on all this. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, how do you have time to spend with your wife? I, mean, I don't. It sounds like. Okay, this That's is how the marriage works. Wife, number six. <laughs> <laughs> six. Come on now. No, just one. Only one for oh. me. I, very, I, I said I'm getting married one time. That's it. I did it. You know, so that's what works with me and my wife. I never see her. So, <laughs> well, you know, you know, I, I'll admit when I I don't like leaving, but when I come back, they've really missed me. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> is it that they miss you, or that somebody else can take over the workload, work, house workload? Well, it's probably that because I'm one of those kind of do everything dads. You know, I I cook the food, I take care of the house, and I uh, I do all that stuff. And uh, you know, I was a I was a chef in a former life, so. I love to cook and, and like I've got a I've got a meal going on down there right now in the pressure cooker and uh oh and, nice. Uh, I used to own a restaurant in, in, in Los Angeles called the Mad Carrot and it was a I've been into the health business. You, you know. owned a restaurant too? Oh yeah, I had a restaurant well, right What on the beach. haven't you done? Um that that's I, a better question. You've done it all. What haven't you done? 
Well, I haven't owned a bar yet, but I'm thinking there's a bar. That if things go well for me, when I finally decide to retire, I might go back to Florida. And I've always wanted to buy this place called the Ocean Deck down there. It was a place I went to when I was going to say called the Ocean. I was like, the, the Ocean Deck. Oh, yeah, we have this thing ocean. down there called the Ocean. <laughs> On the East Coast. <laughs> But yeah. I, uh, I've always loved this pub, and it's got live music every night. It opens up into the sand. You can literally sail your board or your or your boat up onto the beach and walk in and have dinner, then sail back out. I mean, it's just an amazing place. And That's I've always cool. I've always wanted to own that place. And so I'm thinking maybe when I get older, if I go back to Florida, if I if I get tired of all this other stuff, which I won't, I'll be honest with you. I love playing music and making movies so much. I'm never going to do anything else. You but, you just love life. I mean, you're having a blast right now. You don't even look old enough to have done all that you've done. <laughs> that's so great. funny. But one of the shows I did, um, and this lady was serious, man. So, you know, Paul and the guys are quite a bit older than me, obviously. And so we're, we're at the table, and she came up, and she looked at Paul. She looked at me. She looked at the band. She looked at Paul, and she looked at me, and she goes, Damn boy, you look good for eighty. <laughs> you were serious. <laughs> well, I mean, she's right though. For eighty, you look great. <laughs> well, fifty, so, not so much. But I repeated that one time in a show as a joke. I said, "Hey, don't I look good for?" Because you know they play this video of me at the beginning of the show where I'm with all the bands and stuff, and um, and it shows Paul Revere and the Raiders, and I get up in, it, in this one, and I got, I was, I look pretty good for eighty, huh? <laughs> and of course the audience laughed. But what I didn't realize was that a lot of them took me seriously. They thought I was serious. <laughs> I was like, "Come on, That's man! I'm half that. What are you talking about?" Well, isn't Richie Burn? Richie Burn? Isn't Chuck Chuck Negron? <laughs> yeah, I bet you guys get confused a lot. Isn't Chuck Negron eighty? Yes, yeah, it's close. Yeah, yeah he's he, got to be at least seventy-eight. He looks phenomenal and still sounds. Yes, he does. It sounds yeah. great. I love Chuck Negron. He uh, and he married a he, and he married a girl that's like forty years younger than him or something. Richie went to go pee. Oh. Hey, it's a side by. It's a split now. Yes, here, high five. I I can't do it this way. There we go. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, this is this is fun, man. So uh, so what's it looking like there? How's your weather doing? You are you hearing any more? Like uh, we we well the tornado warning went away. Um, yeah. however. I, I looked at my phone and saw the tornado warning went away. And then I heard the hail come. I thought the timing is wonderful, but it's calming down right that's now. Good. Yeah. So is this weather so, that's coming up from that hurricane? Is that what's going on? Yeah, they said this is remnants from Hurricane Ida. Oh, no kidding. Uh, Ida's a terrible name for a, a, such a destructive hurricane. Because Ida was the name of my great-grandmother who was just like a saint. The sweetest old woman you can ever meet. And this isn't a, this isn't an Ida hurricane. Yeah. There's also a tropical storm Larry coming up, which is also not the name of a trop. I mean, Larry could be destructive. Larry could be in, in, in unintentionally destructive. If you, if you think about anybody named Larry, Larry sounds like your high school biology teacher. Yeah, yeah, not not a hurricane. Yeah, yeah. Hurricane Darren, that's a good name, you know? It's kind of, you, you want a blues riff when you hear Darren coming. You know, that's cool. Hurricane Darren. That's um Hurricane. That might be a good name for a band. Hurricane. Like that, actually. Yeah, well, you can rock you like one. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, a lot of this new stuff that I'm doing is, um, it's really rocking, man. With, with some, I'm getting to play the kind of guitar I always wanted to. I'm, I, I, what I wrote, kind of guitar do you play? Well, I play them all. I've got like on this oh. on this room, I've got strats, Les Pauls. I've got three or four acoustics, a couple of basses, tellies, you name it. It's in here because every every guitar oh has its God. place if you record a lot. You know, people think you can have one guitar. And that's not the way it works. You need a different guitar for almost every song. You know, I'm glad it's not the case with pianos because that would be really expensive and that's space you consuming. Keyboards, man, they're all electronic now. You have a symphony in there. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I've got an electronic piano. Yeah, that, but. I'm, I only need the one. Yeah. Thankfully. Yeah. If, if it was... Guitars, it's not that way. Now, if I do a gig, I'll do the gig with one guitar because live, it doesn't really matter. But when you're in the studio all the time, you'd be surprised. I mean, people people hear electric guitars, they think they sound the same, your untrained ear. But then when, you, when you're recording a track, you know, I can like, for instance, I can play my Les Paul 
it just doesn't sound right. I could just pick up the strap, just doesn't sound right. Go through the sounds, pick up the telly, and it lays in the mix perfectly. They're they're really a lot more different than what people realize. So for each style of music you play or each song, you you need the guitar that sounds right to you for you to play it. That I'm so naive when it comes to the world of guitars. I know what Les Paul is. I I know these things. But. Yeah, they they all have different like uh, you know one might be more punchy in the mid range. One might be better on the bass. One might have a high end, nice glistening high end. Depending on the song you're doing, uh, people don't realize what how much work goes into recording a song. It's like it takes me three, four hours to get the right guitar thing happening. You know, I mean, I've got to EQ it. I've got to put effects on it. I've got to clean it. I've got to put noise gates on it. I've got to, I've got to use the, I've got to go through the settings on the guitar to see the right one. Because once you got your drums and your bass and you're starting to lay your rhythm tracks, I like, for instance, I might lay a rhythm track with a Les Paul and then we throw the piano in there and throw some horns in there. And now the Les Paul doesn't sound right anymore. So I have to go back and play it on another yeah, yeah. guitar because they sound different. Totally they really different. do. They're different animals. That makes a lot of sense. I got I got this instrument. You might have heard in the uh, Eddie Three Stooges. I, I don't know if I should do it because of copyright laws, but yeah. <laughs> a little we, we sample to, of my musical those, talent there. The last two <laughs> 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 uh, the last two what songs? Oh, there's so much fun. They're awesome. <laughs> You do this every show, bro. Yeah, but he was telling me about the difference between Les Pauls and like different guitars and how important each one is for right. it to go with different instruments. I right. wanted to show off my musical skills to so someone well, who hasn't seen that yet. You you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Your musical prowess is amazing. Amazing. Well, I I appreciate that. And our our uh, we've got a few comments to show. Um, Rye Gold is telling us Bill Medley and Paul Revere are both nice guys. So happy to hear that. This is quite an interview. Very enjoyable. Pouring rain here in Edgewater, New Jersey. Lots of fun to watch this interview with the Yankees game on. We're we're great Yankees commentary. That's your job, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. I can handle that. Yeah, we have to, it, we have to talk about that because I'm I'm here in KC. I, I've I've become diehard Royal and Chiefs fans now. Have you? Well, yeah. Chiefs are easy. You know what's cool about it? Uh, this is what I love. When I was in L.A., you know, when you're in L.A., if your team has lost two games, people are throwing cans at the players. You know what I mean? Right, so right. When I first came back here, the Chiefs hadn't been winning anything in a long time. And I found it ironic that – a lot like New York fans, actually. I found it ironic that uh, the, the fans were all still walking around in their colors. They were all still pulling for the team, even though the team didn't even win a game one year. Right, but the fans were all there. They these fans don't go away when the team stops doing well. It reminds me of New York, actually, because I remember I lived in New York for a couple of years, and you guys are diehard fans in the Northeast too. Right, Jersey and New York are like, whoa, man, those are diehard fans. Of right. Oh, I, nobody's worse than a, I, I'm from the Philly area. Nobody's worse than Eagles fans or no. Phillies fans. I mean, they're violent. They're mean. They're yes, they are. They're very emotional people. <laughs> Like, but like, you know, if you would feel better if I could send you, if I could take you to South America and take you to a soccer game, you'd think they were oh, pussy wow. cats. Oh yeah, I've I've seen the English hooligans, the soccer fans, the they English beat each football other fans. To death down there, man. They are so into their. Oh, well, here's a story for you. So when I lived in I lived in Reseda, California, briefly uh, about ten years ago. I had a little house up there with a you know in Reseda, which I when I first moved there, I didn't realize it's a heavily heavily Hispanic area. And I didn't learn that till I'd moved there. And I was really glad when I did learn it because my Hispanic neighbors were some of the best neighbors I've ever had. Really wonderful people. But I, I used to wear a, um, uh, what was the shirt? It was, um, oh gosh, I used to wear it on set almost every day. I had this real big, comfortable soccer jersey. And I, I forget what team it was. But anyway, so I wore it to the grocery store in Reseda one day. And a young checkout boy walks up to me because he'd see me in there all the time. And he walked up and he goes, you're a brave man. I said, why do you say that? He goes, you could get killed wearing that, that jersey in here. Oh, man. my God. I said, are you serious? He goes, oh, yeah, we, we're serious about our soccer. And that's the enemy. <laughs> wow. I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like, like it'd okay, be justified, too. What, what was the team? I don't remember. What I'm trying to remember what that shirt was. 
South America, somewhere down south, like Chile or something like that. So, so the there, police I, would I, say, I, you, I, I got a, a website where I'm, or I'm wearing the shirt. <laughs> the police would say, what happened here? Look at his shirt. Justified. All right. That's what they, and they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, we can't have that. Let's see here. Where is that shirt? I know it's here. There we go. It'll come up. Yeah, I'm, I, I wore it on set every day because when we're on set, we're on set for hours. Oh, there you know, it from, is. From, from this angle, I see a little John Corbett in you. You got the John Corbett neck and hair. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. It's Brazil. That's what it was. All right, so don't wear a Brazilian shirt. Where? In Los Angeles. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, because it's all, they're all from Mexico there, and they love their soccer, man. <laughs> Crazy. But Did we, they uh, call it football there? Yeah, foot, foot, football. But they were such uh, It, it such only makes sense. Living, man. You talk about having Span Hispanic neighbors. They used to just come over, not uninvited, come over and knock on the door and bring trays of food. Hey, my mother made this tonight. We thought you guys would like to try it. And I tried all these like, like Hispanic wow. Mexican dishes that I'd never tried before. And boy, it's just the greatest food in the world. So good, right? It was so good. You can't stop eating it. Mm -hmm. Which in our business, that's not a good thing. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. So Darren, we're we're coming to we're coming upon the hour. Yeah. Um I want to thank you for, for taking the time, man. Seriously. Oh, I'm clear. sorry, I was a bit distracted because I didn't know if I was gonna get blown out of the house from a tornado, but it was a rare, rare New Jersey tornado warning, but you know, the, the odds are almost nothing of you that happening to you. So don't sweat. I've I've had them uh, literally coming that. down on top of my car before, so I I just drove away. <laughs> that the, you know there was a um, the, a shopping center near me. A tornado touched down, threw a shopping cart up in the air, landed on a car. The tornado disappeared, just kind of like a fuck you to that whoever's car that was. Yeah, I just I just wish I could have seen the guy's face when he come, came back out. Like, stop! I had a shitty day at work. I go into the supermarket. I'm just gonna get some groceries, maybe make my day a little better. But I go home and eat dinner at night, and he goes out to his car, and there's a smashed up shopping cart, a shopping cart smashing up the roof of his car, so he couldn't get in. It, I mean, it really did a number. It was thrown way up in the air, and he down and smashed the roof in. Wow. Hey, would you ask but, everybody, can you ask your uh, followers if you get a chance to follow me either on Facebook or Instagram and help me with this contest? I need all the that votes. That was the next thing I was going to do. How can they, what's your social media? It's just Darren Dowler, D A R R E N D O W L E R. So Facebook, Darren Dowler. There's one page, Darren Dowler Music, if you'd rather go to that one. Instagram, at Darren Dowler. TikTok, Darren Dowler. I'm pretty much Darren Dowler on everything. I'm easy to find. It's DarrenDowler.com. Super yeah, interesting Darren bio, right? website. Thing. And yeah, yes, there it is at Darren Dowler. Really need the support, folks. If you could go to a Facebook, go to Facebook, look up Darren Dowler, and just there's a link there or on Instagram. Just go to the link and vote, 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 because I'm up against these young bands who are much more internet and uh, community internet savvy than we are. So, yeah, look, if, if Vicky, if Vicky Potato at his age can become an internet sensation, you can too. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I'll tell you who's going to be the internet sensation. My daughter, my my daughter, my sixteen year old, is a singer. We just produced her first full song. She wrote this beautiful song, so we just produced it in the studio last week, and it came out so incredibly good. I was like, "Wow, I can't believe that this came out of my kid." And the song is just dynamite. And she's already been getting calls on it from some television people and things like that. So you're kidding? No, my my daughter's amazing. She's only sixteen, and she hasn't done a video in a year. But by the time she was 14 and a half years old, she had already done 100 music videos on YouTube. Wow. Seriously, like, that's 100 more wow. than I've ever done. That's I think it's 6,000 like, subscribers or something on YouTube. And I think I have 700. Wow. So, I mean, she's yeah. kicking dad's butt. Wow. Unbelievable. Good for her. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, awesome. good for her. That's great. Got a good she, head on did, her shoulder. she take after you? No, she's much better than me and everything. <laughs> <laughs> she, she tells me at eight years old, I want to be a fashion designer because I don't know if I can really count on music. And I was like, wow. <laughs> eight years old, she said that. And I was like, she's an old soul. Amazing. 
And that's what she's doing. She's studying to be a fashion designer, but she's also, she plays four instruments. She sings like crazy. Just, her name is uh, Raina. So Raina Dowler on YouTube. Anyone's checking out. R-A-I-N-A. R-A-I-N-A. Raina yeah. Dowler. And she's, so, she's been doing videos since she was eight. <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. So if you're watching, follow Raina and Darren Dowler on yeah, YouTube, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, all your favorite social media sites and, and watch, look, I got to encourage people to look at your videos and go see you live because that I was blown away. They I, mean, were we, I did too. They were oh, thank you. unbelievable. Great. Just well, great. Videos. I hope to get up there toward your neck of the woods and perform one of these days. Cause I love, I absolutely love performing in the Northeast. That's where I, I cut my chops up there. I lived in Connecticut. I lived in New York. And when I was a really young kid, I moved up there so I could learn the business and, you know, play with better players and, you know, get right. on theater and stuff like that. So, but I love music fans up in your area of the world. You guys are the real deal, man. Thank you. I, I got to ask you about one more guy before we go. Yeah. Um, all right. Cause this is a musician, my original co-host, Justin, the great singer, by the way, he fronts a queen tribute band. You got to hear this guy's voice. Yeah, great. Man. Great. Um, I'd love to hear that. I oh, suck. <laughs> Um, he, he told me he met Gary Puckett when he was 10 and Gary, Gary was just rude to him and said like, you know, get away from me, kid, you're bothering me, something like that. But I met him outside the Keswick a couple years ago and he was really cool. Let us take a picture. He was awesome. And you work with Gary Puckett. Was he a cool guy? Gary, Gary, cool is not even the word for Gary. He might be the, one of the kindest, most yeah. giving guys I've met in the business. As a matter of fact, when I play my, um, you know, entertainers are weird, uh, but a lot of them have really weird egos. You won't even know it sometimes until it flares, but some entertainers have some massive egos and it comes out at times. Not Gary. He, so when he heard I was leaving the Raiders and going to do my own show, he had heard me say to somebody, I need some quotes for my, my, prom, my presentation video. Yeah, he was the first one who picked up the phone and said, hey, Darren, I think it's great you're going solo, man. You, you need to get wow. up and do the Darren Dowler thing. He goes, I'll give you any. I'll give you any quote you want, man. You can use my image. You can use my quote in your video. He goes. I just want to help you, man. And that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Just as an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's always that. I saying told him too, it was probably circumstantial. If you're asshole to one person, three hundred people will hear about it. If you're nice to one person, ten people will hear about it. That's how right. it works. You could be more right, Darren. So and we right. can all have a bad day. You know, I've had my bad days. I've been a prick on days. Yeah, we, yeah, exactly. I, 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 um, I just want to know if you did you happen to talk to him about the hit song he's got, "Young Girl." Did you tell him you should change that? Maybe uh, just legal age girl. You're out of get out of my mind. One of the skits <laughs> when I was writing comedy skits a few years ago, I, I had I used to do this character called Carl Ray Trucks who had. White trash living. I'm Carl Ray Trucks. Welcome to White Trash Living. I think there's a couple videos still on YouTube with Carl Ray Trucks, and uh, we were we were doing this thing. This one skit we were writing was uh, we. I don't even know this. now. You see, you, you, as a comedian, even you, you have to know what it's like. You have to be careful what you say anymore because everybody gets offended at everything. But we did this. I said we should do this album called the because uh, I know this other guy, uh, Benny Mardonis, who also had remember that song. She was 16 yeah. years old. Benny Martinez, yeah. There's all these songs about these young girls. I said, yeah. man, we could do a whole album of that. Of that. <laughs> you're 16. You're all beautiful and you're mine. <laughs> she oh, was man. only 16. Even only Kiss 16. is a song. Christine 16. Christine Remember that? 16. Yeah. 16 candles. There's a lot of those. 16 was the big age back then. <laughs> I guess it was, man. That's when my I, my mom got pregnant with me at sixteen. So I guess that was kind of a thing back then in the 60s, 50s, and sixties. <laughs> well, Darren, thank you again. Thank I you, really man. appreciate you taking the time, and we'll let you get back to your crock pot. Thanks, or, buddy. Uh, what 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 is it? Your uh, it's a it's a pressure cooker. Yeah, a pressure cooker. <laughs> Same it's thing, fast. right? It's just a fast crock pot. Is all it is. He, all right. It was great meeting you, man. Really you, cool. Hey, send me some links of your performances. I'd sure. love to see them. I'd Absolutely. love to see them. Absolutely, man. I've watched you. You're great. You're great, Thanks, brother. I, and I'm looking yeah. forward to checking your stuff out because I love good comedy. He says you're about yeah. the best. So, 
He's 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 lying. I, 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 I'm I'm just grateful that he filled in to co-host. So it's easier to have someone else. You, you, Rich, Richie, you did great. You said yeah a lot. You said wow a lot. You're perfect. <laughs> Well, thank I love you, Richie. Awesome. Richie. Thank you. Seriously, thank you. You'll have to me. if you guys get a chance. Go to my personal Facebook page. I mean, you can go Darren Dowler, but just Darren Dowler. Go to my personal Facebook page, and you can see some clips of two or three of the newest music videos we're working on right oh, now. They're really coming out nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I really do like your stuff. I was listening. Very. I love the whole rhythm and blues thing you got going on. It's great. Yeah, it's my favorite stuff, man. Oh, awesome. All right, man. Hang out for just a second, if you could. Sure. So we're going to say goodbye to everybody watching. I really appreciate you tuning in again. Thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Jason. Tune in next week when we've got Anson Williams, uh, oh. a.k.a. Potsy. All right. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Bye, guys.